Uh, we have a great panel and a great session. I uh, just wanted to give you a preview of the next few uh, months. Uh, in February, we have Dr. Mark Linsky from University of Pennsylvania uh, on atrial fibrillation. Uh, will be the topic of the panel discussion. In March, we have Dr. Califf, uh, formerly of Duke, formerly of the FDA, currently with Google, um, and we'll do a topic in artificial intelligence and cardiology. Uh, in April, Dr. Rick Nishimura from Mayo Clinic, um, who we're privileged to have here fairly frequently um, on a topic on valvular heart disease. May, we're privileged to have um, one of the true legends in cardiology, um, Dr. Eugene Braunwald, meet Sinai's legend in cardiology, Dr. Valentin Fuster, uh, and we'll do probably just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion, fireside chat between these two legends. Um, those seats are going to be sold on, uh, in June, uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Marty Leon from across town. Uh, from Columbia on a topic in coronary artery disease. Uh, today's topic of assessment of coronary artery disease, uh, multimodality assessment, um, is really a very hot topic in cardiology, and we're lucky to be represented on our panel by really uh, world experts who happen to be based here at Sinai. Um, we have uh, Dr. al Kazaz, who uh, he and Tara Naib are our two clinicians on the panel. Uh, all of our people are uh, uh, very good clinicians, uh, but that will be their expertise represented on the panel. Uh, Dr. Larakis, who's professor of medicine and cardiology, director of non-invasive cardiology at Mount Sinai System, um, will be representing nuclear and echo. Uh, Javier Sanz, who's director of cardiac CTMR, um, here at Sinai, an associate professor uh, representing for CT and MR, uh, Dr. Zai Fayad, Director of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Institute, Director of Cardiovascular Imaging Program at the Lucy Moses and Lucy Moses Professor in Medical Imaging and Bioengineering, Vice Chair for Research and Professor Department of Diagnostic Molecular and Interventional Radiology, and finally, Professor of Medicine, Division of Cardiology. All of those things, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, certainly, Joe Sweeney, um, who's Assistant Professor in uh, Cardiology, is representing uh, Rational Thought, um, uh, representing the cath lab. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Mike Hadley, um, who's also um, an expert and will be an expert. He's signed on recently. Uh, to do a fourth year here. He's in the middle of a second year in CT and MR, uh, which is certainly a growing field across the country, and we have great leadership here, and he's going to be working with them. He's going to give an overview of the topic. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to provide a brief overview of uh, today's topic before we dive into our panel discussion. Coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death globally and in the United States, and the burden of CAD is expected to continue to grow with industrialization, westernization of low and middle income countries. So the diagnosis and management of coronary artery disease is therefore critical to efforts to reduce premature morbidity and mortality worldwide. Today our panel will discuss different strategies and modalities for the assessment of CAD. Non-invasive testing may be classified in several ways. Tests may be categorized as either anatomic or functional. Anatomic tests evaluate for anatomic evidence of coronary artery disease, but not whether a particular stenosis causes ischemia. Functional tests evaluate for the manifestations of coronary ischemia, typically resulting from a stenosis of at least 70%. Common anatomic tests include coronary calcium scoring, coronary CT angiography, cardiac MR, and more recently, electroanatomic mapping and CT fractional flow reserve modeling. Common functional tests include exercise electrocardiogram tests, stress echocardiography, radionuclide, myocardial perfusion imaging, positron emission tomography, and cardiac MR stress testing. These tests may be categorized as either exercise or pharmacologic. Exercise tests require the patient to exert themselves, reproducing a physiologic, the physiologic conditions that bring about the patient's symptoms. Pharmacologic testing with vasodilatory or inotropic agents 
is typically reserved for individuals who cannot exercise for more than several minutes. So which test should we choose for our patient? And the answer is, of course, that it depends. There are three main parameters that guide the selection of diagnostic modality. First, the capabilities of the institution performing the test. Second, the patient's characteristics and preferences. And third, the specific clinical questions being asked. So let's explore each of these briefly. First, institutions vary in the availability of different diagnostic equipment, local expertise, staffing, time constraints, and financial resources. For example, most institutions offer ETT, but few have the capabilities that we have here at Mount Sinai for PET, CMR, and other advanced techniques. Second, patient characteristics often restrict the choice of test. For example, patients may be unable to exercise, lie flat, or be constrained to small spaces within an imaging machine. Additionally, patients may have contraindications to particular tests, to vasodilators, inotropes, contrast agents, radioactive tracers, or even to a powerful magnetic field. And finally, the utility of different tests may be hindered by different factors like body habitus, limited echocardiographic windows, an uninterpretable, uninterpretable electrocardiogram, or significant coronary calcifications or prior stenting. And third, the choice of testing mortality depends on the specific clinical questions being asked, and this is kind of the most complicated subject. There's a lot of nuance here, but I'm going to summarize it briefly as five clinical scenarios as follows. Screening of asymptomatic individuals, initial evaluation of stable symptomatic patients, non-invasive testing in acute coronary syndromes, evaluation of revascularized patients, and viability testing. So the first scenario is the screening of asymptomatic individuals. Here, anatomical screening for coronary calcifications may inform prognosis and guide preventive measures. Current guidelines recommend, recommend that clinicians consider a coronary calcium score for patients with a 10-year ASCVD risk of 7.5 to 20%. And a higher calcium score in these patients suggests that the benefit of initiating cardioprotective medications likely outweighs the risks. And a positive test also predicts initiation and adherence to medications. Stress testing has not been linked to better outcomes in asymptomatic patients and is not typically recommended, but some exceptions include competitive athletes, persons with occupations affecting public safety like airplane pilots or bus drivers, high-risk patients starting an intensive exercise program, and patients with limited functional capacity planned for high-risk surgery. The second scenario is the initial non-invasive evaluation of symptomatic individuals. Here, all commonly used tests have been shown to provide some prognostic information. However, no randomized trial has yet demonstrated a benefit to all-cause mortality associated with the use of one non-invasive modality over another. So several guiding principles apply when it comes to selecting a test. First, when possible, exercise testing is preferred because it provides additional information on functional capacity and hemodynamic responses to exercise, which predict prognosis independent of ischemia. Functional testing may also identify a culprit vessel in patients with multi-vessel disease on anatomic testing. Second, pretest probability of ischemia may affect the choice of a test. So in patients with low pretest probability, guidelines recommend the use of ETT as a widely available and cost-effective test. Alternatively, clinicians may select a highly sensitive test like CT, coronary angiography for patients with intermediate to high pretest probabilities. Guidelines recommend testing with stress echo or MPI. And in the highest risk patients, a negative test may be a false negative, so these patients may be referred directly to angiography. Although non-invasive testing should be considered to provide prognostic information, localize ischemia, and identify patients most likely to benefit from revascularization. Third, the overall treatment goals may affect the choice of a more sensitive versus more specific test. So for example, if the goal is to rule out disease, clinicians may consider coronary CTA, whereas if the goal is to rule in disease, clinicians may consider a more specific test like stress echocardiography. And it's important to note that CMR and PET are both highly sensitive and highly specific, but are not always rapidly available or, or widely available. And fourth, the clinician may select a test because it provides additional diagnostic information. For, for example, ETT may identify exercise-induced arrhythmias or chronotropic incompetence. Cardiac MR can diagnose cardiomyopathies and assess the burden of fibrosis. And ECHO provides information on ventricular and valvular disease, which may determine that surgical revascularization with concomitant valve intervention is preferable to PCI. The third clinical scenario is non-invasive testing for ACS, specifically unstable angina and NSTEMI. Um, so it's typically indicated in ACS for low to intermediate risk patients 
without classic signs or symptoms to assist in risk stratification and management decisions. You know, in patients with ongoing chest pain and a non-diagnostic electrocardiogram or biomarkers, rest imaging with MPI or echo can assess for the presence and severity of ischemic myocardium, assuming there's a baseline for comparison. ECHO can also assess for other etiologies of chest pain, like pulmonary embolism or aortic dissection. Stress testing may worsen acute ischemia, and so is contraindicated in such patients. And in patients with resolved symptoms and negative biomarkers, stress testing can help risk stratify patients prior to discharge. MPI and ECHO are the most commonly used modalities. Coronary CTA can also be used to rule out significant disease and has been shown to reduce length of stay compared to other testing modalities. CMR stress, when available, can detect active ischemia via myocardial edema, variable perfusion, and regional, regional wall motion abnormalities. And uh, for the fellows manning the consult list, an early outpatient stress test is a reasonable alternative to inpatient testing for the reliable and compliant patient with a low to intermediate pretest probability for ACS, provided the patient has negative biomarkers, no ECG evidence of ischemia, and an outpatient stress test scheduled within 72 hours. Patients with high-risk stress findings are usually referred for coronary angiography and potential revascularization. The fourth scenario is the assessment of ischemia in revascularized patients. And these patients are at risk, of course, for stent or bypass graft stenosis, as well as for the progression of native CAD. For asymptomatic or low-risk patients, stress testing may be considered to assess ischemic burden in partially revascularized patients to risk stratify revascularized patients who are starting a cardiac rehab program or to risk stratify revascularized patients who initially presented with silent ischemia or atypical symptoms. In these cases, stress MPI and stress echo are currently recommended to determine the distribution and severity of ischemia and also appear equivalent in terms of their sensitivity and specificity. Of course, for high-risk patients with clear ischemic symptoms, coronary angi angiography is often preferred as the therapy most often requires PCI. And the fifth and last scenario is the assessment of hibernating myocardium. Approximately one-third of patients with an ischemic cardiomyopathy have viable hibernating myocardium. And in patients with a significant volume of viable myocardium, revascularization can improve systolic function, reduce ventricular arrhythmias, and may improve survival. Recommended tests for assessing viability include dobutamine stress echocardiogram, MPI with thallium, FDG PET, and CMR. And CMR and MPI with thallium uh, are the most sensitive test for identifying viable myocytes. Conversely, FDG PET and dobutamine stress echo have the highest positive and negative predictive values for identifying myocardium that may recover following revascularization. And new methods for detecting viability are under development. Electroanatomic mapping of the endomyocardium can identify regions of viable versus infarcted myocardium. Additionally, myocardial contrast agents can be used to assess myocardial perfusion on echo, although this is still pending FDA approval. So in summary, the assessment of CAD is critical to guide decisions on management. Non-invasive modalities vary in terms of their accuracy, availability, and ability to answer different clinical questions. This remains a controversial and evolving field, so additional studies are needed to compare the advantages of different tests on hard clinical outcomes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, you did a very good job uh, about the subject that there are so many opinions, but let's try to do the best today, particularly with a fantastic site visit of uh, the professor William Zorkby. I will say a few, que few issues I will say about him that um, I think are pertinent today to be a very special day, since he has been a great contributor to the field that is going to be discussed. Well, uh, Dr. Zogby was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and he uh, studied uh, at the univers American University of Beirut, and then he started uh, medicine there, and he finished here in the in, in United States in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. He became an intern and resident at uh, Baylor, College of Medicine in Houston. He had his fellowship there. And then um, he, uh, from assistant professor, he became associate professor. And then if you understand Houston, I don't, what happened between the Methodist and Baylor and the changes and so forth, he ended up at the DeBakey uh, uh, Methodist Hospital 
uh, sometime in the early 2000s. And here, uh, there he became the director of echocardiography, the director of the Cardiovascular Imaging Institute, certainly professor of cardiology, and at the present time, the Elkins Family Distinguished Chair in Cardiac Health at the Debecky Heart and Vascular Center and chair of the Department of Cardiology, almost as many titles as Dr. Fayad. <laughs> but anyway, um, all very well deserved. He's an outstanding academician. He had many awards and honors, uh, outstanding faculty award at, the, at Baylor, outstanding teaching award, American Society of Echocardiography, Richard Pop Excellence in Teaching Award, outstanding achievement award from the President of the Republic of Lebanon, and so forth, so on. Uh, if we go into quickly into other accomplishments, uh, he has been President of the American Society of Echocardiography, uh, President of the American College of Cardiology, Board Member of the World Heart Federation, and in in, he's in the Scientific Advisory Board, has been uh, at Siemens and Philips. Now, if you look at um, his commitments in guidelines and research, he had 40 commitments over the years. And the same about national committees, also 40. So a lot of work in the editorial board of the main journals. I don't have to go into any detail, but just to say that um, he had research support from NIH, American Heart Association, the American Society of Echocardiography, ACC, and other organizations. The bottom line is what he published, and he has more than 300 papers about physiology and hemodynamics of any, almost of any entity in the cardiovascular field, and, uh, and particularly as they uh, are in the context of imaging of the different modalities. And more recently, he has been very involved uh, in issues of global health. Well, I want to, I'm sorry, I went a little bit quick uh, but uh, we have a lot to discuss today, and uh, congratulations uh, for being here today, uh, Bill. You are fantastic visiting professor. They enjoy the day. Everybody I talk to and who interview with you, and thank you very much for coming. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, this is, the, uh, this is the plug that says everything right and signed January 27, 220, and says to you for being a great teacher. Thank you so much. And here's a check. I don't know how much it is, but <laughs> it has never been too generous in my view. <laughs> 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 anyway, thank you okay, so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. What is my call? All right. Thank you. So you can sit in the middle, maybe. Thanks. Michael, you mm -hmm. can. Well, we have more experts than ever in a field that anybody can say anything they want. <laughs> so can I call them again? Uh, Mohamed, uh, Dr. Leraki, Stara, Javier Sanz, and Sahi. I must say, when Martin Goldman asked me to take care of this subject, I was a little bit reluctant because the situation is that uh, it's a very complex, it's very difficult, the literature, the literature is quite controversial, and I just want to take this light off right now because it's not the moment I want to present this. So I'm going to be very methodic because otherwise we'll get all of us will get lost. And, and let me start by saying that we are dealing about non-invasive assessment of coronary artery disease. And I think there are three main topics here. The first one is the diagnosis with such non-invasive modalities. The other is what is their predictability in terms of cardiovascular events. And the final one, are these modalities helping us in deciding about revascularization versus optimal medical therapy. These are the three main questions that we are going to be addressing today. Now, uh, the, the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, perhaps present four different concepts 
and, uh, and maybe you, Dr. Stock, uh, may be in agreement or not, but this is the way to start. And the concepts are very simple. Uh, the first is about uh, perfusion imaging um, modalities versus modalities that look at the vessel wall with exercise, for example, echocardiography, stress echocardiography. And if you look at these modalities, um, basically the principle is um, that uh, perfusion imaging appears to be very sensitive, but not so specific, like the modality of uh, myocardial uh, you know, systolic function, for example, with echo stress, which is more specific, but uh, is less sensitive. Um, do you agree with that? Uh, yes, Dr. Fuster. I think overall agreement, if you look at, there are some studies in the literature that have compared, actually, probably the first one was from our institution, where we use simultaneously, and this is, takes away you know, different patient population. We did the same exercise on the same patient, same medications, and imaged with echocardiography as well as nuclear techniques, and that was back in the 80s. Yes, things are a little more sophisticated at this stage of the game, but we know that perfusion and wall motion are closely linked, but for you to be able to see a wall motion abnormality, you need to have a little more ischemia for you to be able to see it, and remember that most of these interpretations are rather Subjective, so you're looking at you're not quantitating with wall motion. You're you're looking at um, whatever is available, and the expertise comes to play, and so many other things. But overall, if you look at those data, and those data told us actually it's about the same, but maybe nuclear is a little more sensitive, a little less specific. The data in different cohorts have also substantiated that. So that we'll talk in a moment about it. Uh, basically, what we are saying is that uh, perfusion imaging, uh, you really can get anybody who has some ischemia but with lots, with a number of false negatives, whether the other, uh, you know, uh, false positives, I mean, whether the other, the specificity of the, of the motion abnormalities is great, but uh, then you can have false negatives. And it depends, it depends, we'll see this in a moment, what you want to achieve with every different type of patient. And also, Dr. Fuster, things have changed over time. Many yeah. of these earlier data were done without, uh, I'm looking at why would you have false positivity with, yeah. with nuclear, right? Is some of the inferior base and closer to the diaphragm in the past, we did not image in prone or yeah. correct for that. So we're left with those earlier studies, and there isn't really a real look at these data in current days. So okay. we haven't really looked let's, at that. Let's look at two other modalities. Uh, let's say PET and MRI, for example. It looks that, again, it's high sensitivity, but some decrease in specificity. You can detect many things there. Is that right, Sakhi and Dr. Sam? Yeah, I mean, I think for PET is also true that you, you, you know, you, you're back into the same story in terms of uh, specificity, yeah. So you can detect uh, uh, many false positives. And then what is interesting, however, and this is going to be part of the discussion today, why not to go directly to the coronaries and do a, a CT angiogram? And I don't think you have false positives, false negatives, at least it's, it's highly sensitive and highly specific. There are exceptions, the microvasculature, we'll talk later, but it seems to me that if you really want to be on the ball, anatomically, not functionally, the use of CT angiography is a way to go, and many people are taking this. Uh, you agree with that, Dr. Stockley? Uh, not completely. <laughs> and the reason for it is, uh, I think it gives you a lot of information, but information regarding Anatom burden, anato anatomy, burden, mm -hmm. uh, end product of atherosclerosis calcifications, right? But if the, if the question is, does this individual have ischemia, yes or no, it becomes problematic. In the extremes, it's very good, but where it counts at times, mm -hmm. it not, may not be good by itself. And this is, this is the issue. It tells you you have disease, but if the individual, like Michael said, you know, there are scenarios where they're asymptomatic versus symptomatic, but if they're symptomatic, 
and the lesion is 50, 60, whatever it is percent, we know we have issues. We know we have issues anatomically of defining whether this is a culprit for that ischemia. And the issues are, I know we can discuss them later, is the extent of calcification, if there are too much calcium in there, and the accuracy of your, of your uh, anatomic evaluation, even if you throw in FFR. So th there are issues, unfortunately, but it can give you tremendous information about the anatomy. No question about it. This will come, obviously, in the discussion. Dr. Lerakis, uh, when you have all these modalities that we mentioned, we, we, all, we already talk about six, but there are many others. Yeah, you have a patient in front of you, and you really have to, there are two questions there. What modality I use, and we will talk about this, but the other is what cannot be done in this given patient, you know, might not be able to exercise, might have a lot of iron in the body, and you say my MRI cannot be done, which I disagree, we'll talk about this in a moment. There's so many issues, he's taking beta blockers, and you, and, and you know, you want the patient to exercise, he's not taking beta blockers, and you want to do a CT, and you cannot do it. I mean, how many, what percentage of patients that is referred to you, you would say, I cannot do what the, what, what the, the doctor who sent the patient wants, because of some of these, characteristics I am mentioning? Uh, <clears throat> well, it depends on the, uh, on the patient uh, habitus. Uh, depends. So I, I would say about uh, maybe 5 to 10 percent of patients who come for one test or the other who are not able to do because of uh, another line of reason. Uh, and this can be many, uh, some of body habitus, like a guy comes for uh, Stress echo, he has a body habitus peak or a COPD person that you cannot uh, have good windows, so then you have to do an alternative test. Some other patient comes for uh, nuclear stress test, pharmacological, has uh, asthma, again, you cannot do it. So, so always there's a problem, but I think we have so many modalities today that we are never can run out of doing the test. Uh, we may not be able to do the modality that the doctor will refer for, but in the end, uh, we'll be able to do something and detect and be able to come to the correct diagnosis for the patient. Yeah, but sometimes you have a patient that only has angina on exertion, and you end up with the patient being injected with dopamine or something else that has nothing to do with the physiology of the patient. So it's very worrisome. Yes, I, I, mean, I agree with that. I agree. Dr. Sand, uh, in this institution, I think we have a problem. And you tell me if it is a problem or not. I think it is. If I want to send a patient for an MRI and has a pacemaker, absolutely I'm saying no way. That's what I heard. What happened? What's wrong when all the other institutions, this is starting with Hopkins, but then evolve all over the country. Today, we can do MRIs with patients who have all these devices. What is wrong? Yeah, so there are two types of devices. Some of them are MRI compatible, which means they are designed specifically to, to be done, uh, you know, can you use the microphone? Of course. Yeah, the, the, I was saying there are MRI compatible devices that we can do an MRI. Something that people sometimes don't realize about with these devices is they are close to the heart, they create artifacts. So even if the study is safe, the study may not be diagnostic for some applications in the heart. For example, if the patient is undergoing a brain MRI or something else, a different story. But going back to your question, I mean, we know now there is data that legacy devices, those that were not designed to be MRI compatible, are probably safer than we thought. And this requires a multidisciplinary collaboration between radiologists, cardiologists, and electrophysiologists. It's very important that electrophysiology is involved. And I think part of the resistance that we had in this institution is that we have never had that agreement of a system that we can do routinely for those, for those devices. Well, if I ask tomorrow for an MRI, as I did last week, on a patient who had an ICD, I had to really call 1,000 people in order to this to happen. If it's an MRI non-compatible device, we are not doing it currently. But do you think, excuse me, the group of Hawkins is challenging that. They say that Definitely. all the devices have been equally compatible for years. In fact, their data shows that. Definitely. I mean, the, the safety is much higher than we used to think it was. It doesn't mean that it's completely safe. So there's some precautions that need to be taken. And you have to have people that are familiar with those devices and able to intervene if there's a complication. William, what is the answer for, from you? I mean, I agree that 
number one, I would go back to the indication of why would you need an indication to do an MRI. If it is for viability, there are many ways to look at viability. And at times, depends on the device, can have much more interference. I mean, we have experts here in MRI. That's not my expertise. But knowing, you know, knowing the field is, if you have an ICD, you're going to have much more artifact than just a regular pacemaker. So it truly really depends on the clinical question to answer. And uh, that's the good thing. Now, in the past, you know, we had two modalities. <laughs> we had no MRI, we had no CT, so it was an echo or a nuclear, and that's about it. So it's less confusing, not only to the cardiologist, but also to the internists who are evaluating many of these patients. Now you have quite a few other options, which in a way, to me, mitigates some of the issues that a patient may have with this or this clinical scenario, and I think it's up to us, the ordering physician, as well as to the on the receiving end, because just like uh, you know, was mentioned before, is at times we may change one test for another. It's nice to have a laboratory where you could do that to, to optimize answering the clinical question. To me, is is truly about answering the clinical question. What is the best test for you to answer whatever that clinical question was? Can I ask you how, how many MRIs have you done with people having devices in the last year? I don't know, but I can tell you we're among the leading institutions who've done with devices because we've collaborated with neurology and radiology for us to monitor many of this. So it was taxing for our cardiologists to be there just to see what, what the monitoring situation is. But overall, it's quite safe. The, the, higher, the higher the concern usually is, is how dependent the patient is on the device. You didn't give me the number, though. No, I don't have the number. All right. so. <laughs> we accept it because you're a visiting professor. <laughs> okay, let's now go into <laughs> let's now go into five different types of patients, because this is where the game is being played. And the, let me begin by the screening of the asymptomatic individual. And here it is already a paradox that I like to see how you respond. And that is uh, the, the current guidelines actually recommend against performing. Uh, a stress test in most of the asymptomatic individuals. And on the other hand, when you go to the guidelines and they say when you have an intermediate risk, you might do some testing among them, coronary calcification. So what's happening here? Is that we cannot do a stress testing, but maybe we can do coronary calcification. William, do you have an answer to that? I think this is an interesting field, and I think you see over the past, I would say, five, ten years, but certainly over the past five years, uh, a different look as to this. In these patients, we're not looking as much for ischemia, but you're looking at modifying the longer-term risk of these individuals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and part of the reason for this change in paradigm is the more and more availability and, and uh, acceptance of calcium scoring. Because to tell you the truth, and you know that very well, in the early days, we had the technology, but we didn't have the data. <laughs> and uh, data has accumulated so well now that it is a very good prognosticator. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the, the, in the uh, intermediate risk, if you will, how often, if you do stress testing, even with nuclear, which is the most sensitive technology, how often do you get a positive Yeah, but test? let me tell it's you. six percent. I want to be a pilot. Yeah. All right? I want to be a pilot. Or I have, uh, I, uh, I am the driver of a bus with school children. That's a different. And I have uh, diabetes, uh, very advanced. Now, would you reject to do a stress test? Yes, I, just like Michael mentioned, there are a few situations okay, where you want to, but we're talking about the yeah. vast majority of the population. If yeah. we're going to do stress testing on the vast majority of the population, even yeah. with intermediate risk, yeah. you're going to end up with a positivity of close to 5 to 6%. Yeah. And an amazing thing, yeah, I mean, we're talking about the asymptomatic. The amazing thing is if you take a look at all the emergency room admissions, mm -hmm. they come to the emergency room, 
overall risk without previous infarction of stress testing is about six to five percent. So positive yep. stress testing. So if you stress test the individuals of, you know, asymptomatic individuals, even with intermediate risk, the positivity rate is so low, it would be better looking at the other way around, meaning I want to look at the risk of this individual. And a calcium scoring in the asymptomatic is much better because... Yeah, but they, you know they are laws. If you want to be a pilot, you need to do a stress test today here. No, we understand so that. So that's the problem. The, the, the issue is that it's not an issue of judgment even. What is happening is, is a reality. Uh, no, I'll tell happening. you another thing, uh, Dr. Fuster. Uh, it's not only the pilots. It's anything that's dangerous or even competitive yeah. sports, right? Use the oh. rockets. Yeah. All of them are stress tests. Yeah. And they do stress echocardiography. I mean, that's actually much more accepted because of radiation, et cetera. They do stress echo on the vast majority, yeah. on all of them. Okay, Mohamed. Um, coronary calcification. Hmm? It seems it's a good test. And certainly it is suggested that could be done in intermediate group of people uh, where you may have some concern anatomically rather than physiologically. Uh, what do you think? Are you using it? So just uh, a couple points. So the, in, in the intermediate risk patient, there are many ways we can help those pedipipin to higher or lower for the sake of primary prevention, I'm assuming here. They're asymptomatic. So one is calcium score. Others is inflammatory markers like high sensitivity CRP look for PAD, diabetes, and so on. But let's say they're intermediate, you choose calcium score as a way to uh, risk stratify them further. The calcium score, per se, uh, will not help you identify stenosis as much as how, what's the burden of the disease. For example, there will be a calcium score of more than 400 predictive or forced outcomes uh, based on age and gender and ethnicity, which might lead to more testing to identify the level of stenosis. It's generally recommended if you're above 400, even if you're asymptomatic, to look for obstructive lesions. But the main use of calcium score, at least, is for primary prevention to help guide decision making in terms of statin initiation, for example, to improve outcomes and reduce myocardial infarction. In terms of treating CAD, because once you prove they have calcium score that's positive based on the percentile and based on the score, um, treat, you'll treat them like CAD with statin and so on. And then you'll have to decide next step, should you do further testing, whether it be it with CTA to define the anatomy clearer or with functional stress testing based on their symptoms, based on their profile, and uh, based on the score. There's some data, the higher the calcium score, particularly above 400, you can <coughs> pursue more aggressive testing to decide uh, what to do with them. And then the question come, define the lesion, what to do with it, that's a separate discussion. Yeah, but let me tell you, let me tell you, I was in Medicaid, and maybe William knows about two months ago, with the group of Medicare, Medicare okay, in, the, in this country. And, and the reason they call me is about calcium score. They were only interested in one thing, when it is zero. Nothing else. At the moment you say it's hundreds, you should go out of here, because you're making life expensive. So what they want to have is a calcium score of zero is extremely, financially speaking, is great because you don't do all the tests and you stop there. And I think that's the critical issue. Same with the treatment, and same with the treatment. Because yeah. Zero, because even if it's less than 100 and they're a young person and they're on the 95th percentile, we kind of more push toward treatment than not, so. But I think in this uh, intermediate group of people, uh, uh, Tara, I think you agree that the calcium score, I think we probably should be doing it more and more because we may avoid to do all sorts of things, uh, tests and so forth. You agree with that? Yes, I do. I also Good. think that it's important, it's a, it's a useful test to do in people who have either an intermediate or even a low um, ASCVD risk score, who have a strong family history, uh, younger patients. I sometimes will get it either to reassure them or to push them towards maybe starting a statin um, and, and pushing the, their lipid profile down a little bit. So family history, I think, is very important. It's often sure. not really included in a lot of our, uh, our, uh, our risk assessments. Good. So, Michael, let's summarize. When you're a symptomatic person, we don't do exercise tests except in people at high risk, and we have to do it. But calcification, maybe we should be more generous, particularly in the intermediate risk group, with a number of events between these differences between 9 and maybe 20% in, in terms of 10 years, whatever formula you use, okay? Good, now we come into 
a very tricky business here. And this is where I brought the slides because otherwise it's very difficult to be diluted. But it's the symptomatic patient, the patient who comes with chest pain, and you really are not entirely sure whether the patient has coronary artery disease or not. And, I, and I'd like to present the situation to you uh, because we are going to talk about these boxes in the most simplistic way, okay? And uh, the patient comes for an exploration whether or not has coronary artery disease and actually has chest pain. And let's begin here. There are six steps that I want to discuss one by one and what are the pros and cons. I think it's appropriate to address the pretest probability for the presence of coronary stenosis. You all agree with that. And the question is, what are we talking about? Well, you may end up with less than 15%, 15 to 85%, more than 85%. Where do you get this from? This is a meta-analysis to address the three most important variables that lead to the probability. First, is the patient having typical angina, atypical angina, or really some kind of pain that is not anginal? And, and obviously, you see the numbers here of uh, predictability are higher than here and are higher than here. So that's number one. Number two, are you men or women? And here you see the difference. In one is higher than women in every stage, here and here. And the final is your age, and we all know that. Older you are, higher is the predictability. I think this is important. Uh, is important in terms even of, of the cost of what you are going to do. So I just want to start by saying that perhaps this approach is, is a good way to start. Then here you come up with uh, what is the predictability. You will see this in a moment. Here you may do optimal medical therapy. Here you may advance and to do something else. And here at the beginning, between 15 and 85%, now comes the issue of the tests. And here is the question that I would like to address now. And is what, if you do the stress test that we mentioned, how you do predict the risk that each of the tests is telling you? And I would like to ask a few questions to you. We discussed six tests here. And I want to know if the test is positive. Now, how positive it is that you can say is predicting high events, middle events, or low events? And I, and I will start by going test by test, because I think that's basically what makes you to move further. So is the predictability of a test that is reasonably positive. OK, and now I'm going to start asking William. Oh, let's, let's, uh, let's see. Oh, Dr. Sweeney is there. Dr. Sweeney, you do a stress test, and you look at the electrocardiogram, and there is the so-called Duke score, in which uh, basically you look at how far do you go in the stress test, uh, that you don't reach the maximal heart rate. You, you just get uh, before that. And in addition, you have angina. This appears to be a very positive test. And if the number of meds is less than 10, the Duke, the Duke score tells you this is significant ischemia. Do you agree with that? Um, no. You don't? Why not? Because I think the imaging aspect of a stress test uh, trumps an EKG itself. Well, what you are saying is, I don't like to do EKG stress testing. I think this is fair. Right. Yeah. In for, fact, for, for yeah. a patient such as this, an intermediate risk patient with symptoms. Yeah. OK, let's assume, and I ask you the question now, that you do the stress test, and now you have an echocardiogram with you. So what would tell you that this patient is in these categories, high, intermediate low, because you're going to be acting differently depending on what you find. Right, so uh, on a stress echocardiogram, when I uh, get those results from uh, my colleagues, I will look at, A, how far the patient goes. Well, which is the EKG too, the same thing. Correct, what else? but at that level of, 
of performance is the ventricle augmenting uh, in a way that is consistent with no ischemia, or is it consistent with ischemia? Dr. Lerakis, the patient has ischemia. My question is different. Is how much ischemia you need, because we will go into the ischemia trial in a minute here. So you have to tell me whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and you are doing an exercise echo. Yes, so uh, depends on the World Motion Score Index. So the more uh, segments of the ventricle that you have ischemic, the more severe is the ischemia. And also other things that we look for is uh, LV dilatation. If you have LV dilatation, that's a bad sign. So that's a significant ischemia consistent with multi-vessel disease or uh, left main disease. So, the, so you look for the extent and the severity. The extent is how many segments. The severity is uh, the whole muscle score index. If from uh, yeah, normal sure it becomes dyskinetic, yeah. that means that is. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Sweeney feels the same. It's what you are quantifying is the degree of the abnormality. Uh, William, we'll talk about the ischemia trial in a moment, but the reality is that whether it's moderate or whether it's severe, you do not you do not intervene. Are we talking about the ischemia? You are the ischemia trial, I'm just telling you. They did exactly the test we are talking about. And they called moderate, yeah, too significant. We will go into the trial in a moment, but I'm just want to see how, how how you react. The, That's the all. Cutoff, I mean the cutoff, at least the earlier data, I'm not talking about management, but looking at prognostication and, and many people will be managed differently depending on what the situation yeah. is is uh, a cutoff of a wall motion score of 1.4, which means at least two segments that are ischemic. Yeah. Now, we know from previous data, the, the worse the wall motion, the more extensive the wall motion, the prognosis is worse. Despite, despite knowing, meaning the clinician knowing what the data is, and despite alteration is either medical therapy or revascularization because none of them are natural history studies, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I mean, you have to, I mean, when you look at, at the literature, you know, most of these are actually, you don't know what really happens to these individuals. Mm -hmm. And many things happen, but it is a manifestation of risk. Could be a conglomerate of large vessel, small vessel disease, could be hypertension and so many other things. And that's why, when we look at any stress test, we look at, right, well, the duration it, of exercise, how much ST segment yeah. change, in addition to what happened with yeah. imaging. Well, you're answering the question quantification, and you have based on that. But now uh, I'd like to uh, ask Michael uh, about the ischemia trial. You remember, these were patients who had a CT angiogram. The patients had coronary artery disease, and they had a stress test. And the stress test actually was moderate or significantly positive. And the results were the mortality was not affected. And, and that's basically the principle. They, they, I think the curves begin to separate after two years, but that's a different story. How can you put this together? Here, what they say is you now go into an angiogram and you do all these things. So can you tell me what the answer is? Why this chemia trial is denying to you to go further? And here, anything that you read in terms of algorithms, you go further. Sure. You think this is, you think this is data is too late? This data came after ischemia, actually, what I'm presenting to you. So my understanding is that with the ischemia trial and prior studies that have looked at the same question, there's still a paucity of evidence to revascularize a patient with stable ischemic heart disease, at least early on. Um, with the ischemia trial, you have to take into account the fact that not everyone who got that CTA was randomized to moderate to, to a stress test. People with uh, left main disease were excluded and went for revascularization. So that may account for some of the, the benefit that we're seeing in revascularizing these patients earlier. Um, but I, I, don't, well, I, I don't think it necessarily well, changes practice. It just sort of, for me, reinforces the practice I'm already, I'm already conducting, which is that if a patient has a significant angina, they benefit from revascularization. Well, I think, I think you're in the right track. 
basically ischemia has to be seen by all the patients that were excluded. That's ischemia trial. And that is patients that were very symptomatic, they were excluded. Patients who had significant ischemia with three vessel disease were excluded. Patients with left main disease were excluded. And those that were included in the trial, actually, the, um, in terms of the interventional line, was much better from the quality of life of the patient. So in my view, and I like, William, what you have to say, but ischemia has to be interpreted in two ways. First, all the patients that were excluded. And second, it has to be interpreted by the quality of life actually improved in the interventional group. You know, I have to add the third one, the curves are beginning to diverse after two years, after three years, actually, which we'll see in years to come. I mean, the study is, is not published yet, right? So we know from yeah. uh, what was presented. And I cannot but agree with you more. For us to apply the results of ischemia, you have to understand how were the patients excluded. And I know from many people who have enrolled patients in ischemia is if an individual had extensive ischemia, they were not enrolled. So you have to look as to what kind of patients did we end up with. Remember, you know, the ischemia, the extensive is, or moderate and above was like 10%, I think, perfusion defect, three wall motion uh, scores. But if you look at these patients, about a third, to my recollection, had no symptoms. Another third had one angina episode per month. So you have about 60% that were barely symptomatic despite their ischemic yeah. burden, right? So but they are very stable patients. I think it's important. The, the, very important. the physicians were very smart too. When they saw a lot of trouble, they, they, they didn't exactly. put the patients into the trial. So I, will, I mean, it's hard to judge early before we see the publication, but these were, yes, you had a larger extent of ischemia as opposed to mild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not the very severe, and overall, they were stable patients. Okay. Can I just, uh, just make one comment to this? Yeah, sure. Go so, ahead, Mohamed. Yeah, so we were pending the publication, of course. Uh, we, we had to review everything and get the peer review process going and everything. But based on what a presented in AHA, it was a very overall well-conducted study, and they um, had, I'm not going to say all of them were severe, but some a portion of them were severe, like I think 25 or something, and many of them are to severe. The thing from it I personally take, beside left main or low, low LV, uh, like LV dysfunction and ACS, if they have three vessel disease, we can relax and we don't have to rush them to the, to the cath lab and we can conservatively manage them for a period of time till we have a patient, doctor, discussion and see what the option it is. I'm not saying we should not take them to cath if they prefer to be on less medications and have better quality of life and maybe there will be a mortality benefit in five years. But they remember, get the they were very stable. Definitely, very, definitely. Very stable. And they excluded anginophoria. And what we know is, we know the cutoff of inclusion. You see what I mean? Let's say above three segments, where the majority three to four segments, as opposed to six or seven. We don't know the upper limit of how extensive the ischemia is. We know the threshold. You see what I mean? Beside the functional testing, their anatomical, if you look at the involvement, they had like 30% or so three vessel and they had multiple prox LAD, I think 40 or so, I forgot the exact numbers, but 40, 30, 40% 40 I think uh, prox LAD yeah. and 30% three vessel. So for me, from an anatomical standpoint, at least beside the functional issues with their, their testing, and they used a lot of EPTs as well, which is, uh, have its own problems with the treadmill, it gives some relaxation as a clinician to kind of give me time, excluding the severe angina, excluding severe LV dysfunction, excluding left main and so on. You are very excited. No, just a minute. Just no, but, but uh, that's another, good. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's good to be yeah, excited. It's he really got excited. into this trial. <laughs> but, but and the problem, is not, the problem is not published yet, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly, but to remember. <laughs> yeah, OK, remember now. Also, there was a 25% crossover at some point of time yeah. in the duration to interventional. Okay. So now, yes, I agree with you. You could, you could take your time in stable patients who have a little more than we like. Yeah. of ischemia. Now we get into something that you disagree, William, at the beginning, you say I half disagree, but now I want to see Dr. Sands 
and Sahih Fayyad to make their comments, and then you can comment, OK? This is the story. And I am part of this because I'm beginning to use city and geography more and more. OK, that's the reality. So instead of everything we said, somebody may say, you know, I don't care. I want to know if the patient has coronary disease or not. And I don't want to go to all this testing and predictabilities and all of that. And I am going to do city and geography, OK? So that's basically the issue. I think the pretest probability is probably appropriate. There is nothing against it. But I'd like now to present recent data. The first data that was interesting was the PROMIS. And I think you were part of the study, isn't it, William? Well, the PROMIS study basically randomized the patient comes with chest pain in a group is treated with uh, city and geography, and then from then on is decided what to do, and the other is done is stress testing or any kind of functional test. And the results of PROMIS were negative in terms of the follow-up. There was no difference in number of events, mortality, and so forth. But recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, the Scott Hart study was published for the second time. And this is very fascinating. These are large number of patients, 4,000. They were randomized. They had chest pain, like the patient we are discussing now. And the patients were randomized into a CT angiogram and then life in front of you versus functional stress testing. And what's interesting, the amount of revascularization was 15% uh, in possible angina, prior, doesn't matter, but more or less was similar. What was not similar is those who saw the angiogram that had coronary disease, the number of medications that they began to take was significantly higher than those who didn't know or they could not see whether or not they had coronary disease anatomically. What I'm really trying to say is that it's for the physician and for the patient, many times it's nice to know whether the patient has coronary artery disease or not, because you might modify your risk factor profile depending on what you see. And this is what's shown in the Scott Hart study, but something else was shown that has to be validated, and that is survivorship or mortality was lower overall in the CT group that was followed over a five-year period compared with the group that went through all the functional tests. So that's the first thing I want to show. Uh, Dr. Sant and Dr. Fayad, before I go any further, because there's more to present here, uh, how do you respond to this? Um, I think there's more and more data showing that CT may not be just not inferior, but superior in some regards to other modalities. I may be biased, but I think the role of CT is going to be increasing over time. Um, this data comes, I mean, as we discussed before, the data has to be understood in the context of the trial and the patients that were selected. So the data in Scott Hart was patients that were evaluated with either CT or the usual care, and the usual care was mostly treadmill. In the ischemia trial, sorry, in the ischemia, in the um, PROMIS trial, it was imaging modalities for ischemia. Mm -hmm. But even though the overall trial is negative, there are signals within the trial of a benefit. For example, actually last year, uh, in JAG, there was a publication showing that there was a benefit associated with CT in diabetic patients. But it was the same, the results were the same in the non-diabetic patients. So these results make sense, are plausible, because patients or, or doctors start to increase secondary prevention or, or primary prevention therapy, whatever we want to call it at this point. And there are benefits in the clinical outcomes that, again, we need more data, but the data is pointing, I think, consistently in one direction. Good. Sahi? I like this too also. There, but there have been criticism of the bias of patient selection uh, in, in this study. But, uh, but, but definitely, uh, as, as we were saying initially, you know, seeing the coronary artery anatomy. But it's uh, an it, interesting it's approach. And then the other issue is that when William said before, well, you're looking at the anatomy, not the physiology, let's continue. Now with CT, you can look at the anatomy and the score, uh, the, the uh, syntax score, and you can actually do FFR. And whether you do this invasively or you do this with CT, the results are very similar, except that 10 to 15% of the patients that you do CT, the quality is not good enough to compare with invasive angiography. This is another issue. So you're beginning to look at function too, aside of the anatomy. 
And then Dr. Narulo is very involved with this, and, and I think it's fascinating what is happening, and that is now you can look at the CT and begin to identify what is there, the burden of disease, how much narrowing, whether there is a spotty classification, whether there is low attenuation and positive remodeling, and all of these factors make things much worse. Look at the five years of follow-up, and this is fatal and non-fatal myocardial infarction. Depending on these particular qualitative aspects that you look at the CT, this is no adverse plaque factors, he has adverse plaque factors. But if you, for example, have non-obstructive uh, coronary artery stenosis, even if you have some of these factors that I mentioned, the things are actually still significant. And this is just to, to emphasize what is going on now. These are all the aspects that one look at, at the quality of the CT. And here is very fascinating. When, when you do FFR and it's more than 0 0.80, that you will say, don't do anything. The number of events is significantly increased if the number of these variables is more than three. So we are beginning to, to see on CT, not just the anatomy, but we are beginning to see many other things, the functional aspects, you can do FFR, and then anatomical aspects that are different, quality of the plaques. And, and I don't want to touch into any more because we'll talk about the microcirculation in a moment, but William, what do you have to say about all of this? I agree with Zahi, number one, that you're gonna see more and more CT utilization. I am a fan of CT, provided that it is used appropriately. And we have to acknowledge the current limitations of the technology. Number one, obviously renal patients, they, these are out in a way. You have to be concerned about the total body. So you have a, a significant percentage of, depending on the patients, right? Where to me gets problematic is patients who have a significant calcium burden. Yeah, sure. And if you have a lot of, I mean, depends on your laboratories, and it's all over the place in this country and abroad. Some people do not do a CTA if you have a calcium score between 400 and maybe at times greater than 700 or 1,000. And not all calcium scores are the same. Some calcium scores are bunched up in, let's say, in the proximal LAD that you know you have disease, but the question is, yeah. Do you have significant disease that's causing the, this individuals? I know they have a higher risk, but then you need a functional test to figure it out. And the recent data that is also problematic is where we need non-invasive CTFFR, it doesn't work as well. Meaning, in the extremes, yeah. it works great. And where you need it, the standard deviation is about 0.1 or even 0.2. You need it, not, you know, you could go from a 0.7 to a 0.9. So all what I'm saying is, if we use it appropriately, it tells us, even with a simple calcium score, be, be even before looking at the coronaries themselves, yeah, sure. is how to use it appropriately and not overextend what we know and give a clinician a false sense of security or accuracy. And I think but that, anyway, that's my caution. It's an expanding field, which is quite fascinating. Tara, here comes a problem. I am told that 50% uh, of women who have some kind of ischemia, which is proven by stress testing, you do CT angiography or you do invasive coronary angiography and there is no obstruction of the epicardial coronary arteries, close to 50%. And this has led to the issue of the microcirculation. I'm going to be presenting to you three or four slides and I'd like you to comment on, okay? Well, first of all, the microcirculation begins in the arteriolar system, and this is the capillaries that actually move passively depending on how open the arteriolas are. And I will say that most of the studies done related to microvascular disease, contrary to what many people think, is not that there is a thickened arteriola or whether there is a constricted arteriola. In fact, it's the lack of vasodilating properties that the microvasculature has. And the question is, how do you test this patient who comes with chest pain, a woman, and this ischemia for whatever testing you do, 
And then the epicardial arteries are normal. Could be due microvascular disease, could be due epicardial coronary vasoconstriction. And what you do, you inject acetylcholine to see this aspect, and you inject adenosine to see this aspect, and then you look at the flow reserve before and after. And then this is much more rare, which is vasoconstriction that you use when you use acetylcholine here, you might vasoconstrict there, but it's much more uncommon. And now this is actually what you do, adenosine, acetylcholine. And I just want to present to you this data because this is fascinating. If you do these two, uh, you, you have vasoconstriction in the epicardial arteries and you have lack of vasodilation in the microvasculature, the number of events is significantly increased. And there is debate that if there is only the microvascular affected, the number of events is significantly enhanced. And so comes the question, and uh, well, first of all, let me, let me ask you how you react to all of this. These patients are in front of us. And the question is, are we doing enough testing to address the microcirculation with adenosine, for example, or even with acetylcholine, some of them? I think we have enough information when we do that. There are ways of looking at the, um, at the microcirculation, the looking at diastology, um, looking at an echo, um, looking at um, um, perfusion um, with, um, uh, with, with some of the... Um, with well, with MRI or with CT. MRI. Yeah. So I think that you can get an idea of what's going on, but even when, even with the testing that we have at hand, when we do these invasive testing, I think that you can get an understanding of what the disease we have at hand is, and you can kind of treat it. So you can give the patient the calcium channel blocker, you can put them in an exercise program. There are things that you can do to actually help the situation. Um, I don't know how much digging we have to do into actually diagnosing it. Usually it's enough for me to kind of understand what, what I'm dealing with. Um, but, but you can certainly go delve into a little bit further, looking at PET, looking at MR. Well, uh, I will tell that, you, for this uh, I'm not disease. saying that the cath lab here is not good. It's an excellent cath lab, but I have great questions about it. And one of the questions is I still have to see the first patient that I have asked whether it's microvascular disease or not, and the answer is yes or no. And here's the question, are we testing these patients properly? Because what you say, Yes, maybe this doesn't convince me. The data today that is coming in the literature now is a massive data. Is you do PET or you do CMR and you do the CFR less than two, the flow reserve before and after. This is actually invasive and you can get a lot of information with this, but even if we go invasively to start with, the data is in the literature and it's very specific data. It's not like, well, maybe, maybe not. William, how do you respond to this? I think uh, there is less awareness of this in the individuals who order the tests because I know most of these you know, faculty are on the receiving end of doing a test as opposed to ordering a test. But if there is more awareness among clinicians that particularly in women and certain situations that you have microvascular insufficiency or inappropriate, I think then you would do a, an appropriate test and probably PET would be the best because then you can look at coronary flow reserve and see how much really happens at the myocardial level. I'll share with you, I mean, something that most likely will be published in Jack Imaging, I'm not gonna say where, but there is a resurgence of stimulation to look at coronary spasm because now we stopped looking for it. And this group in the world somewhere have studied 14,000 ergonovine echocardiograms to look yeah. for coronary spasm. And it's gonna be very interesting yeah. to have a resurgence. So these are the two scenarios. You have microvascular issues and you may have coronary spasm. As you recall in the early days, my goodness, I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, coronary spasm was present every day in all of our patients. And I think we go from one, I mean, we've concentrated much more on fixed coronary disease as opposed to the other two. And I think there is, you know, there is that continuum or. Yeah. Joe, uh, you. Yeah, I just want to comment on, on your comment, Dr. Fuser. You're absolutely correct. Um, with the physiologic assessment in the cath lab, we do not perform um, 
functional assessment for microvascular disease. But there are some reasons why. Um, the CFR data, by and large, is, is variable data. And I say that in the sense that there's a lot of inter-observer variability. Uh, the re if you take a CFR, for, for those of you who don't know, CFR is basically comparing coronary blood flow at rest and after hyperemia. And the resting CFR can be variable depending on many hemodynamic variables, so heart rate, uh, blood pressure, LV function, uh, stiffness, and so forth. So the outcomes vary just on the same patient. The second is time. It, it takes time to do a CFR um, as well as the, the other more, I think, um, the better test is the IMR, the Index of Microvascular Resistance, which is essentially comparing or, or assessing the microvascular bed specifically. The other thing with CFR is it, it assesses both the epicardial and the microvasculature versus IMR is only the microvasculature. But that is right now only a research uh, platform on a research platform. The software is yeah. only through a research protocol. That is interesting. Let me tell you what's happening. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm speaking for what I see coming into JAG. From this group is coming into this group. The group that is really talking about what I'm presenting today is the non-invasive people. Yeah. Particularly what you mentioned, the name RI and the CFR, less than two and so forth. And this is beginning to be And now the very interesting papers are coming on Doppler echo too. Uh, that I didn't want to emphasize at this moment because still the accuracy is not so good. What I'm really trying to say is better we move on here because otherwise you can do quickly anything you want. But if you really want to understand the physiology of the coronary system, it is so complex, you need time. And I think that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, the, the problem talking about time is we are out of time. Uh, I was going to discuss three other groups of patients an stable angina and non-ST elevation, and then um, the revascularization, hibernating myocardium. But I think it's enough. Uh, we can go into all the other aspects, but I think what is most important is this is a field that is better we pay attention to because all of us are involved in one way or another, the cardiologists, the interventionalists, the invasive people, the imagers, and so forth. And I think we can get a lot of more information than what we try to gather today. So uh, this is now open for questions or comments. Yeah. Two, if the calcium score is off the charts, you never have to do it again. You know, it's an average radiation. If the calcium score is zero, you can wait five to 10 years to do it. Three, it informs therapy. You can withdraw therapy or be more aggressive with therapy. And four, if you get called in the middle of the night and your brain is fuzzy, and you don't really, and you're trying to get a history, to know that the calcium score is zero gives you enormous solace. And also guide therapy if I ever have to say it. So I wouldn't just use it for, and, and should have mentioned. It's amazing how sometimes people at low risk have a ton of calcium that you, you wouldn't expect, and how people at very high risk have no calcium at all. So I don't see why it is, it, it shouldn't be restricted, I, in my view, to just be the index of risk. These are certainly very valid, and I think m most people are using it nowadays for this. I would caution against one thing when you said the middle of the night is if somebody has an acute coronary syndrome, although they may have a calcium score of zero, it has been reported that they can indeed have a acute coronary syndrome. I just wanna make sure that somebody coming to the ED with symptoms and some EKG changes or troponin, that we don't miss that. That's the only thing. Yes. Seventy-eight-year-old male with a recent, probably small myocardial infarction. What tests might you do to uh, 
guess at what his outcome would be over the next four years. Okay, Will. Am I in the past or? Am I in the past? The, the person had am I in the past? I will do uh, most likely on 75 year old, I will do a uh, perfusion, nuclear perfusion imaging to evaluate uh, if he has ischemia to see, to see if I can see the myocardial infarction and uh, see if the rest of the perfusion is normal or is on top of the MI, the person has ischemia as well. Yeah, I think it's a difficult question. Uh, I think you said a possible myocardial infarction, so you're not clear if the patient had an infarct. Did I understand correctly or? So maybe that's the first thing that you want to know. You want to see, you know, if the patient did have an infarct. And for that, even though it's not maybe first line test for, for many of the workup, an MRI would be the, the most sensitive test to, to be able to detect a small infarct or a scar that wasn't, that wasn't negative. But if you do have evidence of an infarct, I think there's a number of tests. I'm not sure I would be able to tell you whether stress perfusion or stress echo, you obviously want to know the ventricular function too. So you'll need an, an echo or, or the perfusion for that. From my perspective, you need two things. You need what is the residual function for this heart? Because you don't know the extent of the previous myocardial infarction. So you need an assessment of ventricular function. Also, you need to know what is the residual ischemic burden on somebody previous with previous myocardial infarction? So a test that will give you resting function and something, a stress test that would give you what is the ischemic burden for this individual down the line after the three years. So you could use whichever way. To tell you the truth, if we are in the cost-effective mode, <laughs> right? And uh, that's probably throughout the world, maybe less in New York and the United States. I would do a stress echocardiogram. You get resting ventricular function and you get the ischemic burden. The interesting thing about stress echo, which is less nowadays on, on the utilization, is remember the first, the first question that Dr. Fuster had? The first question was, which one is the most sensitive and which one is the most specific, right? So I'm, I'm spinning it differently, and I'm saying that in the era of the trial called ischemia, you may want a specific test as opposed to a sensitive test because you're much more conservative in treating patients because medical therapy is very good. You see what I mean? So if you have disease, I know I'd need to treat them with et cetera medications, but I won't intervene unless there is a very large burden of ischemia or they become unstable. Yeah. Interesting, this was one of the cases we were going to present that I didn't, and is exactly what he's saying. Like he's looking at ischemia and function, which is what you need, uh, ischemia and anatomy in, in a way, uh, that is what you need in, after a myocardial infarction. This left ventricle and the ischemic aspect, re residual ischemia. Any other question or comment? Yes, how is your strategy on this testing uh, affecting uh, even for intervention on how long the patient's been on medical therapy? Will, William? You have to... You have a patient who's been taking optimal therapy for six yes. years. Yes, yes. The whole question of whether you stent that patient or not stent them, is that your thing? Actually, part of... You know, the appropriate use criteria for interventions, right, is that individuals are on optimal medical therapy, they're symptomatic, or they have a large burden of ischemia, and then we have to decide what the large burden of ischemia is. And these are situations where you want to stress the individual on medication, not off medications, right? The only time, at least in my opinion, that you take individuals off medication to stress them is if you don't have a diagnosis. I'm not sure that this individual, somebody came in with some atypical chest pain, somebody gave nitrates and beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. You don't want them to be stuck with medications throughout their life. If they are on these medications for hypertension, I would leave them on them because you're looking at the ischemic burden on patient on medications they need as opposed to they don't need. 
Any other question or comment? Okay, I have a final question for each of you. Is what is the most important issue that of the discussion we had today that you go home with? Dr. Larakis? Uh, for me, I think that... Um, yes, very short. We don't have much time. We have today modalities that are... Uh, uh, we can solve and find uh, which patient is chemic or not. Just we have to uh, choose the appropriate one based on outcomes, data that we have. And also the other thing that I want to say is that uh, uh, we should uh, be coordinated for, uh, especially for young women using techniques like uh, CT Good. and uh, myocardial perfusion imaging because of radiation. So that's something that we have to have into the mind, especially for young women. But uh, I think the technology we have, we... Yeah, thank you. Joe? Uh, yeah, don't underestimate the microvasculature. Javier? Um, so my conclusion would be that every technique has strengths and limitations and is going to be driven largely by the patient characteristics, which the one technique is going to be better than the other. And the question of the microvasculature, I think we fail tremendously at diagnosing. I don't Thank know, you. I don't think we know how to diagnose it. Yeah, Tahir? Yeah, definitely microvasculature, but, but also I was very in, intrigued by a, a comment that Bill said in terms of, he said, before we used to have two, two techniques, now we have a lot of techniques. I mean, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. It, I love tools, but I, it's also humbling to see that it's sure. not important to create just tools. You have to make sure you create things that are extremely useful and not confusing. No, but William, you are the last. You are the last word, so let me ask Michael. Uh, I think revascular, uh, microvascular disease is one, and another question I had is, in which patients is anatomic testing, CT, coronary angiography sufficient to guide um, decisions about revascularization? And which populations really benefit? Thank you. Tara? I think you also not just have to um, pick the, the imaging modality or the test that you want to do, but also know what to do with the information that you have and how to treat the patient who's going to be receiving that information, too. Thank you. Mohamed? The ischemia trial. <laughs> No, along yeah. the same lines as Sarah was saying, regardless of which imaging modality you choose, at the end of the day, what matters is changing outcomes for the patient and starting by optimizing medical therapy and then being aggressive when you need to be aggressive and conservative when you need to be conservative. Simply put, statin in the water. Thank you. Thank you. William, your last word. My last word is, doesn't have to do anything with uh, the disease itself. My last word is, this is a complex, field that I think we lack education to our referring physicians and our cardiologists. It is, a, I mean, and it goes back to what Zahi and I mentioned earlier, is we have too many options, and at times we don't navigate them appropriately. So I was very pleased with the two trials that were almost not there before, which is promise and ischemia, that at least ischemic heart disease is back on the randomized trial because all the others are observational one way or another. And I think this is where we need to push the envelope. Number one, to know more about all these and where do you use them. But just imagine how confusing it is for our referring physicians. So the more Communication, the more grand Change. rounds you do, the more whatever it is, I think to me we will do much more impact because all these experts here with me are on the receiving end and they're not ordering the test. And the question is how do you navigate it? Calcium scoring is less utilized. At times CT angiography is overutilized nowadays, particularly with people who have disease and we don't know, we don't want to know more. It's best to be used in the exclusion of disease or knowing the burden. And, and I think more knowledge and maybe more writing in Jack regarding this, position papers, et cetera, on imaging, and I think Michael has done an amazing job to do this. I really think this is what we need. Now, and last one is, we're not looking in this country at cost effectiveness of what we do. And I feel very strongly about yeah. 
getting to the outcome we need with the most cost-effective technology. And I'm gonna throw something at you as a department. You said, at times, and that has not been looked at, and I'm thinking of looking at that. Yeah, but he's right. I mean, I was going to get into cost-effectiveness, but he's, with so, we are so primitive still right. in the whole game. With the starting cost-effectiveness, is like uh, very difficult. Uh, and you moment. just wonder, and I'm, I'm throwing this at you know, the panels here, of a calcium score and an exercise echo. Mm -hmm. Nothing against our NUC and CMR colleagues and CT colleagues, but it gives me burden of disease, gives me ventricular function, hypertension, diastolic dysfunction, many other things. And I think we should explore this. Yeah, you agree. Good. <laughs> Well, and, and, and last, but may I say thank you for, sure. for your invitation and uh, thank you for our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Fuster, for the invitation. Thank you.